This is the beginning of word problems. We have not done word problems yet. And for those in the past that have been like, word problems, the demise of me, right? That's what students seem to say a lot. It's not as bad as it looks. I promise you that. My, my method of teaching word problems is turn English into math. Just like when you take Spanish and Latin and French, you are converting a language. That's all you're doing today. You are literally going to convert from English to the language that we call math. Okay, so we're translating both times here, right? Translating. Let's get started with this. So in example one, all I want to do is practice translating statements into variables. That's it. But you want to practice it first. Then we'll get into the actual word problems themselves and a little bit more difficult word problems in section 1-9. So part A, can somebody tell me a number decreased by 4? If that number is represented by H, H, how would I actually write that, John? Uh, H minus 4. Agreed. Oops. It should be H. Oh, okay. Hold on. My pencil is not connected. It, for A, it is indeed H minus 4. A number, H, decreased by minus 4, the number 4. I'm literally trying, I'm going to try and write that in a minute. I'm literally trying to translate that one piece at a time. A number decreased by four. So when I'm breaking this up, this is the first part. This is the second part. Oops. And this is the third part. Okay. A number decreased by four. If you need to do that, go ahead and do that. Show the other line. Use color coding if you need to. Part B. Eight more than five times a number, Gus. What do you think? Uh, if the number is n, I would do five We'll use h for everything, but yeah, that's fine. Any variable, it doesn't matter. And you said plus? Yeah. Plus what? Eight. Eight, very good. So let's do this one, and let's talk about this one for a second. Eight more than. Eight more than means eight plus. Eight more than means eight plus. So I see eight plus is written on the right side here, right? And it's eight more than five times a number. Well, here's the five times a number right here for 5H. So although it's written this way, I could have written it like this. Because addition is, there it is, very good. Addition is commutative. It doesn't matter the order. If I were directly translating, technically it'd be this, right? Eight more than five times some number. But clearly, they're the same, right? It does not matter. Would it matter here? Sure it would. Is h minus 4 the same thing as 4 minus h? It is not. So part a, the order mattered. Part b, the order did not matter. OK? Part c, part c. Sean, go ahead. The difference between a number and square, h minus h squared. Yeah. A number and it's squared. And this one is important, the order. Because a lot of students think h squared has to go first because it's probably the bigger number. It's not true. H should be one fourth, and then it's one fourth minus one sixteenth, right? It does not matter the order in which I should. Uh, sorry, it does not matter that the number bigger has to start first. It's not said anywhere here. It doesn't say a bigger number minus a smaller number by any means, and we don't know what H is. So I'm directly translating the difference between, right? I start with a minus sign. A number, H, and it's square, H squared. So one step at a time, that's what I'm doing. The difference between is the minus sign, a number is the h, and its square is the h squared on the far right. So far, any questions before I go on to the next one? Any questions about this so far? Do we understand why this is important, right? The equations that we're going to get in word problems come from what we're doing here, come from expressions. Part D, part D, what do we got? Go ahead, Olivia. Two h plus one half absolute value h. Let's make sense of it. Let's see. It says the sum of. Okay, so right away, here's the plus sign, right? We agree for the sum of twice a number, two h, and half of that number's absolute value, half of the absolute value of the same number. So again, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it and point, so you can watch. Again, the sum of twice a number and half its absolute or that number's absolute value. So later, if you're not sure about this, understand that we're doing this one piece at a time, the sum of twice a number and half its absolute value. 
Questions on D? How about E? How about E? Twice the sum of a number in nine. First name again? Nick. Nick. Go ahead, Nick. It'd be two parentheses H plus nine. Good job, Nick. And the key here is even the way I said it, if you notice, twice, sorry, twice the sum of a number in nine. So twice the sum, meaning you're going to do double this sum. So you know that there's a sum already in place, and the sum is some number and nine, and we're doing twice that. So twice the entire sum indicates we have a quantity, right, a quantity, which includes parentheses. So two times the quantity, h plus nine. Twice this sum right here. Okay, questions? Can we move on? All right, let's go on. So let's look at this example here. Now, for some of these examples, you're going to notice in your homework tonight, I'll point this out. These examples are asking for answers in terms of variables at times. So you're not going to get an answer like 7 or 12. The answer might have a team. Is that clear what I'm saying right now? And you're going to come up with an expression. So your instructions in homework are going to say, find the expression that represents the scenario. And it might have variables in the expression. And that's the, that's the case for this example. So for those of you that might have gone ahead and looked at this and were wondering, how do you get the answer to this? It's in terms of a number. It's in terms of a variable here. So let's go through this process. James left his house, drove for T hours, and he drove at a rate of 50 miles per hour toward the city, toward the city. If his house and the city are 200 miles apart, then how many more miles does he have to drive? All right, forget the problem for a second. Let's think about this logically. If I'm 200 miles out of the city, and I drive 30 miles, what's left? How'd you get it? So what's the operation we're ready for? Do you see what I'm saying, right? If you get confused, forget the variables for a second and just think about the problem. You're 200 miles out, you go part of the way, how do you find out what's left? Subtraction. So let's start with subtraction. You know that already. Now, when we did it a minute ago, you guys told me that if you're 200 miles out, and I go 30 miles, I'm left with 170. So what did you subtract from what? What was subtracted by what? 200 minus the 30 in that case. Good. So we did 200, when we talked about this a second ago, and we said if you travel 30 miles to the city, you have 170 left, so we subtracted what you traveled. What you traveled. Now, let's take a look at the problem and see what's going on here. We know that we traveled for T hours, and the rate at which we're traveling is 50 miles per hour. Now give me an answer, okay, and I want the answer to this problem. I want the answer to this question. If I travel for three hours at 50 miles an hour, how far have I gone? 150 miles. Because of what operation? Again, let's do that together to make sure it's all clear. If you know the rate at which you're traveling, and you know the time for how long you traveled, if you multiply those two quantities, you will get the distance traveled. Where is that coming from? D equals RT. We have not written this down yet this year. Write it down on the slide, please. Distance equals rate times time. In physics, you'll learn about this as velocity. Instead of distance, you'll call it displacement. Don't worry too much about it just yet. Okay, don't worry about those terms. What we need to know is distance is rate times time. So the rate at which we are traveling here is indeed 50 miles per hour. And we are traveling for T hours. So 200 minus 50t. If you're not sure that this is right, check out your units. Watch what I'm going to do. 50, what are my units? Units of 50 are what? Miles per hour. So it's 50 miles per hour, agreed? Times, what are the units of t? Hours. What happens to hours? What am I left with? What am I left with units? Just the units, I'm left with are just miles, right? So I know that this quantity, when multiplied, has units of miles. Well, what numbers am I multiplying? I'm multiplying 50 times t. So that's where this comes from right here. And just to prove to you, because what are the units of 200? What are the units of 200? And if I'm subtracting something from miles, what must it be? Miles. You see what I'm saying here, right? This is something from like fifth grade math. When you add, or subtract 
subtract quantities the units must match. Five apples, seven oranges. I cannot add them together. They're different things. If I call them fruit instead, though, five pieces of fruit and seven pieces of fruit is how many pieces of fruit? Twelve pieces of fruit. But if I call them apples and oranges, I cannot add them together. Do you see what I'm saying? I cannot carry over one of the two units and be like, oh, five apples and seven oranges is 12 apples or 12 oranges. Not true. So I cannot add miles to something like minutes. I cannot subtract miles from something like kilometers or feet. I have to convert feet into miles first. The units have got to match up with addition and subtraction. Okay, so this is our answer. This is what's left over. Okay, we could even say if we wanted, like, remainder equals this, but we don't need the R. Don't, don't, don't let the R confuse you, it's confusing. The remainder of the trip is left. Take the 200 you have to travel and subtract whatever you've done. Now, tell me please, what is the domain for T? What is the domain for T? Jimmy? All number, all numbers greater than zero. Close, Jimmy. Time has to be greater than zero, but there's a limit to it in this problem, Jimmy. Uh, the limit is four. The limit is four. What happens once you reach four hours, Jimmy? How far have you traveled? Can you go further? Technically, you can go past the city, I guess. So I should say. But if you are going to the city, what's the longest it will take you? Four hours. If you're going at 50 miles per hour. So we would write that the domain for T is this. Okay, this is domain. We're going to talk about domain more in this class. It's not really going to play as much of a role in your first test. But you should understand this concept that makes sense. Because as soon as I travel for more than four hours, who is this person? James. Not Jimmy. Wait, is that the James is. Okay. Is that the answer? This is just the domain for yeah. T. The answer is right here. Because remember, it said if this house is 200 miles, 200 miles apart, <clears throat> then how many more miles does he have to drive? What is the remainder if he's gone a certain part out of the 200? That's the answer right here, guys. Right. This is just the domain for T. Okay? Yeah, so I thought I heard a word. All right, let's keep. Oh, hold on, hold on. I hit, I hit next page by accident. So. Example number three. Find the measure of the third angle of a triangle in simplest form. If one angle has a measure k, and the measure of the second angle is 15 less than half the first, and we want the third angle. Now, I know a lot of you have not taken geometry yet, but I'll give you a little fun fact, or somebody can tell me this. How many degrees are there in a triangle? In a triangle. You got to raise your hand on the floor. 180. So that is useful if you didn't know that. Okay, because you haven't taken geometry yet. I'm not going to assume that knowledge. I would probably write it on the test for you there. So I've got a triangle. If I want to draw it first, I can. Call this angle K. Call this angle X. We don't know what it is. And we'll call this angle over here. It says what? What am I going to call the second angle? It says that it's 15 less than half of the first. 15 less than half of the first angle. What would that give us, John? Uh, X minus 15 or K minus 15. One half K minus 15. One half K. Uh, half the measure of the first. And we're calling K the first angle. Okay? So half of K minus 15. Let me write this and let me point to it, okay? So maybe you guys could just look up as I talk. 15, right here, and it's less than half of K. So 15 from, meaning take away 15 from half of the first angle you had, which was K. But what is our goal? Our goal is to find the third angle. That's why I called the third angle X. Is that clear? So now I can write an equation. Can somebody tell me what that equation would read, please? I'll tell you, go ahead. Plus the third angle, yeah, which is? X equals 183. Very good. Well done. I just wanted the equation, not the answer. Right? So that's the equation. But what is our goal in this problem? What is our goal in this problem? To solve for x. To solve for the third angle, which is, in this case, x. What might it be useful for me to write at the very beginning of this problem? A let statement if I want to. But because I have a diagram, 
the diagram is indicative of my let statement already. Do you remember let statements? Is that, is that, no? Okay, so this is called a let statement, ready? Let x equal the unknown angle. Let k equal angle one. And then as a result of x and k's definition, angle three is half of the first angle minus 15. So what I'm saying is this, in algebra, a lot of the time in word problems you use let statements. But if it's a geometric word problem, your diagram can be your let statement. Are you with me with that? Your diagram can take place of your let statement when the problem is geometric by nature. Yeah? Would you put parentheses around one half k? So you could, you could, but does it matter here? Why doesn't it matter? What, what operation are we doing with all three of these angles? We're doing what to the three angles to each other? Not division? Addition. Oh, addition, yeah, very good. We're adding them together, so yeah, you could do this. This is what you're asking right there, right? Yeah, you can do that, but think about it. What's outside of the parentheses? Is there a one here? So aren't you just distributing a one to both? Does that change the problem? No. So whenever you're adding three things together, you don't have to worry about the parentheses there because you're adding all those terms. If I were saying the first angle multiplied by the second angle is something, then I would need parentheses for sure. Okay? So I'm going to simplify. I've got k and a half of k is how many k's? One and a half. One and a half. So I could write it as 1.5k if I want to, minus 15 plus x equals 180. How else could I have written it? Instead of 1.5k, what else could you, could you write? Uh, three halves. Three halves, are we all clear with the fractions? We need to know our fractions. We add one and a half, it's three halves, because one is two halves, plus another half is three halves. So I'm gonna leave it as a decimal, it doesn't matter, but actually, I kinda like fractions personally more. So I'm gonna go to a fraction right now. If you want to at this point, you can multiply everything by two to get rid of the three, the two in the denominator, or Honestly, it doesn't really matter as much because your answer is to solve with x. So just move everything over except for x. How do I move 3 halves k over? Subtract 3 over 2k. Subtract 3 halves k. How do I move negative 15 over? Add it. Let's do it all at one step. One eighty and fifteen is one ninety five. Am I like this? One eighty and fifteen is this and this, this is one ninety five. We subtract the three abs k, subtract three abs k. That's a perfectly fine answer. There's no reason to multiply by two. You want to know why you do it? Does anybody see why you do it? Why do I multiply by two here? What would I have to do in the end anyway? Uh, you have to multiply by two to make everything. That would become a three k. This would become. Uh, sorry. This would become. Two x. So in the end, would I be able to get x by itself? And I have to divide by two anyway, right? So if I multiply by two at this point in time, I would have a thirty, a two k, and a three sixty. But to get x by a two x, to get x by itself, I would have a two now in front of it. This would be three sixty, and I have to divide by two, which makes it one eighty. This would be a 3k, which would make it back to 3 halves k. This would have been a 30 when you divide it by 2, go back to 15. So as you do more of these problems, you will recognize that sometimes techniques are useful by multiplying your by the denominator. Other times it's not useful. Okay? It's not useful. All right. Very good. Oops. Let's go to the next slide. That was our answer this one. So again, notice these answers are in terms of other variables right now. In terms of m, what is the sum of five consecutive even integers if m is the fourth integer? I'm specifying this right now. So if m is the fourth integer, I'm gonna write that down. What's the fifth integer? What's the fifth one? Go ahead, Sean. Why m plus two, Sean? Because m is the fourth. Why not m plus one, Sean, or integers? Because it's an even. Good. What do even integers differ by, everyone? What do odd integers differ by? Two. It's not a trick question. I know. 
A lot of people, when they see odd, they use like x plus 3 and x. No, it's still plus 2. Whether or not this problem, write this down, start with the word even. Whether it's that even or odd, it's the exact same answer. It does not change. Odd numbers do not differ by odd. They don't differ by 1 or 3. They differ by 2. Think about it. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. They go up by 2 every time. So whether or not M is odd or even, I'm still going to add 2 to it to get to the next consecutive odd or even integer, respectively. What is the integer that is below M? What integer is below that, Olivia? M minus 2. What integer is below that? Julian, what integer is below M minus 2? M minus 4. And finally, what's the last integer here? Sam, what's the last integer? M minus 6. Right? All we're doing is changing by 2 every time. So this question doesn't ask us to list them. It says, what is the sum in terms of M? So I simply add it all up. And take a look. When you're adding things together, the negative 2 and the 2 cancel, don't they? So there's no need to actually add those parts. Recognize that certain things can cancel. So this becomes 5M minus 10. Where M is the fourth consecutive even integer. That would be my let statement. And I, and I probably should write that let statement, okay? But it was in the problem, so I didn't. Right, it says, if m is the fourth integer, so technically I'm rewriting the last part of the line. Right, yeah, absolutely. Now, if m was not the fourth integer, if it were the third integer, the answer? Oh, quick. If m was the third integer, what's the answer? Right away. Close? Five. Five. Yeah, you have the right idea. Constants can't slap. If m were the third integer, it would be m, m plus 2, m minus 2, m plus 4, m minus 4. The 4 minus 4 and plus 4, the minus 2 and the plus 2, those, in those integer values cancel. You get m, 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 m. Just five. So the, the location for m's value actually matters. The fact that m is indeed the fourth integer does matter in this problem. Okay, let's go to number five here. Let's take a look. Ah, nice. I like this one. All right. A train leaves town traveling at 50 kilometers an hour east. Three hours later, another, another train leaves town traveling at 75 hours east. 75 kilometers per hour east. Same track. How long will it take the second train to catch up? Now, the simple solution to this is to literally make a table. After one hour, how far are they? After two hours, how far are they? And eventually see when it catches up. That's the approach you would have taken on like seventh grade, sixth grade, a table. And that's fine. But I like algebra. I consider algebra to be more powerful. So my first train is traveling a certain distance at a certain rate for a certain time. Train one travels a distance, we'll call it D1, and it travels at 50 kilometers an hour for some unknown amount of hours we don't know. Train two starts how many hours later? How many? Three. Yeah, so instead of T hours, it's gonna be three hours less than that. Take a look at what I just did. I'm gonna fill in the blank, obviously. But again, if the first train has been traveling 20 hours, the second one is traveling 17 hours. It's always three hours behind. So whatever T is for the first train, this one is three less. And we know that this is traveling at a rate of 75. For the second train to catch up to the first train, what do you know about D1 and D2? Yeah. It has to be The distance traveled by the first train, ready, watch me please. The distance traveled by the first train, ready, is eventually going to be the same as the second train. It's going to catch up. So you can set these equations equal to each other because D1 is equal to D2. I'm going to get right to the solution. I would distribute and solve. I will get 9 as an answer. So it's 9 hours into the trip. So how long will it take the second, hour, second train to catch up? We can start three hours later. How many hours is it actually taking to catch up? Six. Six hours, very good. The first train has been traveling for 9 hours. That's represented by T. The second train is always three hours behind. We are 
You are doing 180 tonight for sure, homework, but we will continue with the rest of this problem. I want to show you another way of thinking about this problem. You can think of it tonight, figure it out. There's another way to solve this, not just the table method. You can do table for sure, but another way in addition to this to solve, that's actually pretty easy. If you can think of it, maybe tomorrow you can bring in that idea. Maybe I'll give some extra credit to that idea if you can figure out another way to solve this. There's a whole other way, but not the table method I'm saying. Another way in addition to this. We will continue with example six tomorrow, but again, you're doing 1-8 homework tonight. Okay, you're doing 1-8 homework tonight. I have all the hours after school today. Please feel free to come up. No, that was the right question. Wait, do we need to finish this right? So we've got some other many more. No, so tomorrow we're going to continue with the next examples and then go right into one up. But okay. you do need to do the homework tonight, Sean. Okay, but not the notes, just the homework. Could you take the I mean, these are saying students to do this. If it was like two times seven, and you get fourteen, then church multiplication. But this is the one. I'll take out half. Oh, well, just for addition, never mind. If they put just identity and not addition, then you can take out half. If they just put addition, it's not addition. Okay. I'll try to get Chris back to you tomorrow. Those almost done with them. I'd like to look over them first before I give them back. Okay. Uh, don't worry, because I, I always look over it either way. So what I do is I look at anything you marked wrong and to make sure the points would be the same I would take off and I divide the grades in. So don't bother putting the grades in yet. Thank you, Lola. No, I don't do quiz retakes. You have four more quizzes still. So you have two more quizzes before the next test and two more quizzes before test three. Okay. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same for everybody. I just wanted to clarify that you're coming to yeah. office hours. And you don't even have to tell me. Regular office hours, you can always come one day after school. Any other time, just let me yeah. know so I know what you're doing. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I have a question. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing your odds and I'm also forensics, which is also two days after school. So, like, would you be able to do that? Yeah, there are a couple kids that are in forensics also have regular robotics. You definitely can. Um, we're going to have our first, like, informal meeting tomorrow and our first full team meeting on Monday. Um, now, what days do you know forensics has changed? Monday, That's fine. So the Tuesday, Thursday group are the mechanical people and the Monday, Wednesday are the coding. So if you wanted to help in this fall, you could only do mechanical, unfortunately, like building. But what's forensics? Is forensics all year? Um, most of Okay. Well, if it changes your forensic schedule, you could also help out, thanks, Logan. You could also help out with the coding piece. So if you're interested, next, so next week we only have Monday school. It's Tuesday, 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 and then you guys have three days of other stuff. So the real thing is Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there? Oh my gosh. What was the other way to do this problem without a table of numbers or just getting your distance in every hour? We're going to figure out the other way to do this one. And we have said another draw for that statement. So if there's another way to do this, it's probably a little bit easier than going to the algebraic approach. Fair enough? Maybe you make a, a line graph? Or... Same thing as a table then, right? Oh. A good idea though. 
So he's saying they can graph where the objects are after one hour, after two hours, after three hours, if you can mark off how far they've traveled every hour. But that is a table, really, Jimmy? Um, then you could multiply 50 times 3, 75 times 3, and then, or wait, yeah. Jimmy, you're on the right track at the starting point. I'll give you a hint. He was on the right track when he started that. You wouldn't do the multiply 75 times 3, there's a reason for that. Think about the context of the problem, what's physically happening. One runner or car is getting head start, right? So what does that mean? They're putting a gap between them and the other person before the other person actually begins, right? So what is that gap, Gus? Uh, I'm not sure, but is it 50 minus 3 times 75? No, not 50 minus 3 times 75. So since he starts 3 hours before the other guy, it would be 50 times 3. What's the number? 150. So the first person starts three hours earlier, and the first person is traveling at 50 miles per hour. So if I visualize this problem, person two is waiting at the starting line. So here's the starting line on the bottom left. Here's person one right here. Person two is still waiting at the starting line when person one is already 150 miles ahead. Is that clear so far? Does that make sense logically? Three hour head start at 50 miles an hour. So this gap is 150 miles. My voice is running out, so I need to consider. This happens every day. If, if I know it's 150 miles of a gap, it means that the second car needs to compensate and cover an extra 150 miles on top of the first car. Right? It needs to make up that difference. How much faster is the second car traveling per hour? 25 miles more. 25 miles every hour more than the first car. Yes? That makes sense? And how many miles does he have to cover to catch up? Well, it's 150 over 25. Six. So it's six hours before he catches up. Well, we got nine yesterday, didn't we? Yeah, but, but nine represents how far the original car is traveling. How long the original car is traveling for. So if this one is traveling for three hours less, our answer yesterday of nine, remember that was for the lead car. The first car goes three hours, and then another six hours, total of nine hours. But the second car is three hours less. So if we take away three hours from that, we recognize that we end up getting an answer of six for this problem. Well, just take 150 and divide it by the difference in their rates, which is 25. And think about this logically. What I'm doing, I'll circle it so you can see. What I'm doing is I'm subtracting those two numbers right there. So if I'm running slower than someone else, that other person is going to slowly either be gaining on me or taking a lead more every time, every single time. It's the difference between the rates gives you the amount that they're either catching up by or gaining on the other person. So again, 150 over 25 gives us 6. Our answer from yesterday, we had 9 for T, but our goal, remember, was to figure out what T minus 3 was, which is 6. Okay, so the second car takes six hours to catch up to the first car, which has been traveling for nine hours. Okay. So when you have a question like this, does D1 always equal D2? Or? Well, because the second car caught up to the first one, oh, exactly. they're at the same location, which means their distances are the same. But that is not true. We're going to see in a little while, what if two objects travel from one end and another from another end, and they meet in the middle? Well, now we know that D1 plus D2 equals the total distance, but they're not necessarily equal. You see what I'm saying? So the context of the problem helps me to recognize if this statement will be made or not. And this problem is made because one car catches up to the other. You can do, uh, instead of doing 75 times T minus 3, you can do 50 times T plus 3. Absolutely, very good. That's another way of thinking about it. So we just, it is algebra, you still, but definitely another way. Well done. So call this T. Right? Call the time that the second car has been traveling T, then the car for the first one has been traveling three hours more, so this becomes T plus three. So if we call this T plus three, just call that T, you'll get the same answer. But you'll get an answer of T equals six, because then T represents the second car's time, and the second car has been traveling six hours. And then how do you get the first car? You take the six, this would be T plus three, and add three to it, you get nine for the first car. Yep, okay. well done. A great thing about it. So that's four different ways. Two of them algebraic, right? Just now, make sure it's the manipulation of the second algebraic method. The other method, tabular, numerical, with a table, 
literally sit there, right? Every hour you can put where the cars are and eventually fly on the cross. It's not really the way, the right way to do now, but let's say you do it like second, third grade. And then the concept of graphically or contextually what's going on with the problem. Okay, four different ways to look at this concept. All right. Example six, you go for a job, you leave your house, and you're on south of Park Ave. Or you leave school, let's say school, you're a cross country team. You run south of Park Ave, you're ready to eight miles an hour. An hour later, your brother, friend, sister, whatever, also leaves the school and leaves at home, and goes for a job and runs north of Park Ave. North, at a rate of six miles per hour. But again, it's an hour later, right? Not at the same time. How far are you, how far apart are you after W hours have gone by since you left home? After that, and I don't want the answer, I want the pieces to the answer. I want you to step me through. Can you step, Gus, give me a little piece, step me through it. Don't, don't you put your hand down. If you know the answer, you should be able to know the theory. So what do you think? Give me something. So, Okay. So, W is the time that has elapsed, I agree. Yeah. So, what's the first rate? Uh, eight Very good. The second person, what's his or her rate? Uh, six miles per hour. And how much time has that second person been running for? Uh, one hour later. So, W? w plus one. No? one hour less, right? You think of one hour later, that's why you throw the arrow, right? But W is not the time, it is the duration. It's not the current time. W is not like 6 p.m., 7 p.m., because then you would add one because the other person started an hour later. It's the duration you've been running for. So Gus is absolutely right. That is my starting point. That is my starting point. Now, some people might right away think to make this a negative because the one person is running south on Park Ave, all the other is running north. And if we were in physics class, and velocity is what we're talking about, the direction matters, and you actually would call this negative. But in the context of our problem, I want you to visualize it. Your house or the school is here. You run north. Your brother or sister run south. The gap between you and your brother and sister is your gap plus your brother or sister's gap created between that and the house. So what am I going to do to figure out how far apart we are total? Do you see how much this diagram is help, by the way? Simple little diagram really helps me to recognize that D1 and D2 are not going to be the same here. They're not going to be equal to each other, but we do know that we're looking for what? That's it. What are you looking for? The sum of D1 and D2. Very good. The sum. We want to know how far apart are these two kids, or you and your brother and sister, so the total distance apart is the sum here. Directions that the distance between them is increasing ever more every hour, right? Every hour is increasing. Now, how far is it going by? What's this distance? Well, we don't have numbers for distance. We have variables. So our answer will have W in the answer. What's D1 equal to? Give us a chart. Is EW because the rate times the time is equal to the distance? Very good. Rate right here times time. Well done. And the second one, Sean? Yes. Again, rate two times time two is the distance two. So it's really important that we remember D equals RT from yesterday because we're recognizing here with word problems that we will see it come up often. Okay? It's a traditional word problem in a algebra course. And on your SATs, these distance rate problems are always showing up. All right, so as a result, I simply have to add those together. And I know I'm not going to get an answer with a number. It's fine. I'm going to distribute the 6. Okay? I'm going to distribute the 6. Put this here. Distribute the 6 here, please. And what's our final answer in simplest terms? Is 14w minus 6. Can we talk about this answer? Why does it make sense? It's a lot we can talk about with this final answer. Why does this part and why does this part separately make sense? Start first, Nick, with this part right here. So both the distances, uh, they can add together to the same variable with it. Why does the number 14 make sense though? Because eight hours, eight 
separated from each other, you can sum together their rates. But in this problem, we cannot forget that one of these objects did move for the first half. And that's the minus six. The object that was moving at six miles an hour did not cover six miles in that first hour. Hence minus six. One. Example seven, last one for 180 here. I'm going to write 49. Math is called the little school. It's 26 members. The number of boys is four less than twice the number of girls. How many students of each gender does the club have? Just an algebraic approach. Gus, what do you got? Uh, so I have 26 equals because there are 26 numbers in the total. And then 2x because uh, twice the number of girls. Not for that. And then minus 4. Okay. Uh, and then the last one is the last one. Uh, and then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. And then the last one is the last one. What did you call the number of girls? What variable? G. No, you already named it. Oh, X. X. So what's important that Gus didn't mention, just not to call you out, Gus, and, but what should he have done at the very beginning? What we talked about the other day might be helpful in this problem. The last statement would probably be helpful here. Because if I wrote this to start, right? If I wrote that to start, it probably would have triggered that I forgot the girls in the problem, right? That's what you have to do. So yeah. Total number is 26. If X is the number of girls, and we're told the number of boys is four less than twice the number of girls, then Gus is absolutely right here. It's 2X minus four for the number of boys. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and see if I can slide this down a little bit. Maybe I'm allowed to move this now. I love this program because I can present, but it's not like Notability where you can move things so easily. It kind of annoys me. But boys plus girls is equal to 26. That was the starting line. Right, 26 equals the number of boys plus the number of girls. So 26 equals 2x minus 4 plus x. Again, the number of boys and the number of girls. Simply solve. So it'll be a little bit different than what you got as an answer, right? Move the 4 over, that makes that a 30. That becomes 3x. X is 10. So the number of girls is 10. The number of boys must be 16. Okay, x is equal to girls. See what I do with this, by the way? That's a common thing you'll see in math. 
X represents the number of girls, so G equals X, or G equals 10. That's what I'm saying here. Number of girls is represented by X, so G equals 10. Number of boys is 16. Where did I get 16 from? Where did I get 16 from? You doubled, uh, kind of doubled subtracted. Yeah, I plugged it back into the number of boys statement right here. Double 10, take away 4, 16. Total number of people in the group, 26. This is the kind of problem you don't check x in the original equation. You use a logical sanity check. 10 plus 16 is 26, right? That's your check in this kind of a problem, okay? 10 plus 16 is 26. So last night you practiced this homework. I want to get to 1.9. I know you might have had problems or questions on it, but I want to get to 1.9 first, because tomorrow we have the whole period to review still. Yes? Okay, tomorrow your problem set is due from 1.1 one one to 1.9. You have no homework on 1.9 tonight. So like I mentioned, you should have been working on your problem set along the way. If you haven't started yet, I will promise you I'll say a prayer for you after school today. Say a prayer. It might take you like two hours to do the whole problem set in one sitting. Okay, but I'm recommending you do it because I'm telling you now, it is the best way to review for your test. If you are confident after that problem set is over, I'm telling you, you're going to be confident on the test. I'm not going to ask you things that are very much more difficult than what you're seeing on the problem set. Those are the type of problems you can imagine. And a lot of them are quick problems. So although it looks like there's a lot, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, those sections should take you literally, I don't know, five minutes per section. Remember multiplication, division, addition, subtract, that kind of stuff? Okay, those are quick. 1, 8 and 1, 9, those might take a little bit longer. Okay, those might take a little bit longer. All right, let's move on to 1, 9.